How many of you have ever been hiking? Okay, half of you. How many of you know what hiking is? All of you, good. Just want to make sure we're on the same page. Like some of you, many of you it looks like. I'm not a huge hiker myself. I've been hiking. It's not, not my favorite thing in the whole wide world to do, but uh, I do like it, enjoy it. Being out in nature is pretty cool. Have you ever heard of, how many of you have ever heard of the Appalachian Trail? Even just the name of it. Okay, great. It's probably the most famous hiking trail in the world, particularly uh, for sure it's the most famous hiking trail here in the United States. Uh, it's commonly called the AT, so if you hear me referring to it as the AT instead of the Appalachian Trail, it's because I'm trying to be cool and act like I know what I'm talking about. But um, the AT is an incredible experience. It's about 2,200 miles long. It goes through 14 states. Most people, it takes four to eight months, six to seven probably for, for average people, to hike it from beginning to end uh, for those who try. It's a great adventure. You see all kinds of scenery and uh, wildlife, and uh, it's just great. You can YouTube it and watch YouTube videos of people who've done it. That's a lot easier than hiking it. Uh, I highly recommend that. But about three million people, three million people a year hike the AT. Not from beginning to end, but those are just people that go out, some of them on the weekend, some of them on their vacation, will go out and hike for a week, and they'll just hike parts of it. But about three million people a year hike on the trail. It's a very, very popular trail. About 3,000 people a year attempt to hike from the beginning to the end, which is up in Maine, or they attempt to hike from the end, up in Maine, down to the beginning, down in Georgia. About 3,000 start, only about 750 on average of those 3,000 actually make it to the end. As you can imagine, it's a long way to go on your feet. A lot of things can happen over four to six months that could cause your hike to come to an end. Many people attempt it two, three, four years in a row before they're able to actually get all the circumstances to line up where they can make it. But the great majority of those 3,000 who set out to be through hikers, that's what they call people who go all the way through, don't make it. Only about 750 do. In 2013, a 66-year-old woman named Jerry Largay set out to be a through hiker. She and a friend were going to go from the beginning to the end. They were going to hike the entire trail, the entire 2,200 miles miles. Well into the trip, her friend got a phone call that there was a family emergency and she had to come off the trail. She couldn't stay. She had to go deal with some stuff at home. And she told Jerry, she said, Jerry, you should come with me. You shouldn't stay. Jerry said, no, this has been a lifelong dream. I've always wanted to do it. We're 90% of the way there. I'll do the last 10% on my own. Jerry's husband, who was in constant contact with her throughout the trip, encouraged her to come off the trail. She said, no, I want to do it. I've only got 10% left. I, I can make this last little bit myself. Even some other hikers who were on the trail, you get to know people if you spend four to six weeks passing by each other and sleeping near each other in the tent areas and stuff. You get to know people. A lot of people on the trail encourage Jerry to go off the trail. Jerry's nickname, everybody gets a nickname, all the through hikers on the trail get a nickname. Jerry's nickname was Inchworm because she went so slow. And so none of the other hikers were willing to stay with Jerry to help her. She was going to be on her own for the rest of the trip, some 200 miles. And she knew she could do it. She convinced her husband and her friend and all these other people that it was going to be fine. Most importantly, she convinced herself it was going to be fine. She was going to finally complete her dream of hiking the AT. Jerry wasn't new to hiking. She had hiked a bunch in her lifetime, always with other people, though. She had hiked a bunch with her husband, who was an avid hiker. She had hiked with her friend, who was coming off the trail. They had hiked with groups of people. She had hiked a bunch. And so Jerry's husband and Jerry's friends all knew this about Jerry. She was what we might call directionally challenged. Anybody here directionally challenged? You can get lost in this room before you get out of here kind of thing. That's kind of how Jerry was. And that's why they wanted her to come off the trail. 
That's why they said, Jerry, you, you don't need to try this alone. And she said, it's okay, it's a trail. As long as I stay on it, it'll be good. It's a marked trail. It's a trail three million people travel down. It's a well-traveled trail. It's not like she has a machete and is foraging her way through the forest. It, it, it's going to be fine. She was 90% of the way there. She, she was almost there. 6.30 a.m. on July 22nd, Jerry took a picture with another hiker near a shelter that she had spent the night in with a group of hikers. They all said their goodbyes and planned to meet up at the next shelter, 15, 18, 20 miles a day. That's about what the hikers cover each day. And they all took off, and so did Jerry. It was the last time anybody saw Jerry alive. That was 6.30 in the morning. By 11 a.m., she was lost. 200 miles from her destination, 90% of the way there, and she was lost. The hikers, when she didn't show up, went back and they tried to find her in the darkness, thinking maybe she was just being a little bit slow. They couldn't find her that night. Her husband reported her missing on the 24th when she didn't show up to pick up her supply box that had food and other things she would need for the next part of the hike. And the search was on. Some of y'all probably heard about it. It made the national news. It was a massive search looking for Jerry. Nobody heard from her. No text messages, no phone calls. It wasn't completely unexpected. The section of trail she was on was known at that time to have very poor cell service. And there were miles and miles and miles of wilderness where there just was no cell service. They brought horses, dogs, helicopters, airplanes. Some of the National Guard came. Of course, all first responders that do those kinds of things were there. And thousands upon thousands of volunteers for several months searched the section of trail she was believed to be on. She was gone without a trace. They didn't find any clues at all that helped them locate Jerry. Fast forward two years after she goes missing and there's a surveyor out doing his job. He was a surveyor for a logging company and he saw a tent. He went over to the tent. It was zipped up. He said, hello, hello, hello. Is anybody here? Nobody responded. Thinking this was odd, the tent looked very worn like it had been out there for a while, but it was still perfectly set up, staked in and everything. He unzipped the tent, and there inside, zipped up in her sleeping bag, with her tent neatly organized, all things in plastic Ziploc baggies, her bag neatly packed, her tent in perfect order, there was Jerry in her bag. She was clutching a journal, and on top of that journal was a note. The note read, when you find my body... Please call my husband George and my daughter Carrie. It will be the greatest kindness for them to know that I am dead and where you found me, no matter how many years from now it may be. Her journal showed that she had survived 26 days after she became lost. After the investigators got a hold of her cell phone and got all the proper warrants and things to get into it, they began to piece the puzzle together between her journal and her cell phone messages that she had tried to send. What happened, according to her journal, was that she had gotten off the trail to go to the bathroom. And in the process, somehow, being directionally challenged, she got turned around and she couldn't find her way back to the trail. She tried to find the trail for several days, but couldn't. Her journal also reported that she had climbed multiple times to the highest peak within her view, with her cell phone, trying to get signal, trying to get messages out. And there were a number of messages that she had attempted to send, saying, I'm lost, please send help, here's where I think I am, please send help, etc., etc. She was found approximately two miles from the trail. Investigators concluded that her life might have been and most likely would have been saved if she would have possessed and known how to use one very simple thing every hiker should have, a compass. 
five bucks at Walmart for this nice one. You can get a 99 cent one that you can clip on your bag. It's much smaller, doesn't have all the, the bells and whistles of these. But one that would at least tell you which way you're going and maybe which way you need to go. And you might be saying, well, why is he telling us all of this about this hiker and about this story? Because it has a lot to do with us. Because isn't Jerry's story just like ours? Isn't her tragic ending much like the tragic endings we've faced or in the process of facing or we've seen other people face? Everything can be great one day. You can be smiling, taking selfies and pictures. And then all of a sudden, you can be in a very scary, scary situation the next. We get off the trail to to do something that seems very simple and very normal and very routine. How many of you have ever in your life gone to the bathroom? (laughs) This is like the most normal thing for all humans to do. She got off the trail to do something she had done millions of times in her life, and it cost her her life. And we do the same thing. We get off trail to do things that we see other people doing or that we've done before and gotten away with and we think, hey, this is going to be okay. But then all of a sudden we find ourselves lost and we can't get our way back. Maybe we skip church for a Sunday or two for a sporting event or for a vacation. Or maybe we were just kind of tired of the preacher or tired of the people there or whatever. And we said, you know what, I'm just going to take a little break. And a little break turned into a decade. Or Maybe we stopped planning date nights with our spouse because money was tight or because the kids were busy and we just didn't have time. Or maybe we just weren't really liking each other a whole lot at that time and we just really didn't want to sit alone with each other and have to talk. Or maybe we thought, hey, we've been married 20 years, 30 years. We're way beyond that. We don't need to do that anymore. And we get off that trail, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves in a scary situation and lost. Or maybe we dropped out a small group and Bible study, telling ourselves that we would join again, that it's going to be okay. Next semester we're going to go back. We're just going to sit this one out. Or maybe we stopped eating right. Or maybe uh, we got off budget. And we told ourselves, you know what, I'm going to start next week. I'm going to start next month. I'm going to start the first of the year for sure this time. I'm going to do it. We got off trail for just a minute, and then we never could quite find our way back. Just like Jerry never thought going to the bathroom would cost her her life, we never think that our little detours off God's path are going to harm us. Her story brings to light a much bigger point which is this, getting off the path that God has for us can cost us a lot. I was thinking and praying about all the people that I've helped over the years, most of whom are off path, trying to find their way back, looking for their way back. And I asked myself the question, what do they all have in common? What do they all have in common? Just like hikers who get lost, who pretty much none of them have a compass or they don't know how to use it or theirs broke or something like that. There's that in common with many hikers that get lost. The thing I can tell you that is true of most Christians who get lost on God's path is this. They don't have a compass. See, our compass is the Word of God. It's the Bible. And it's not that they don't, want to have, they don't have one at their house or in their car or at their office. They probably got multiple Bibles laying all over. The problem is they don't read it. They don't understand it. They don't memorize it. They don't study it. They don't, they don't value it. They don't see it as important. And because they have no compass, it's easy to get lost. Psalms 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. The Word of God is important. The thing we've all got to understand, the big idea for today, the thing I want you to catch and not forget is this. God's Word in the matter is always God's will on the matter. I hear so many people saying, I want to do God's will. I want to be in God's will. Then you've got to be in God's Word. Because if you want to know God's will, you have to know God's Word. 
If you want to know what God's will is, you have to know what God's word says. It's never too early and it's never too late to get in and learn how to use your compass. It's not hard to use. It's not difficult to use. You just have to pick it up and use it. This is why we as a church, since the very beginning, have been a church that encourages you to read your Bible every day. We've done all kinds of campaigns and encouragements to read the Bible in a year, to read the New Testament four times in a year, to listen. We've done a listen through the Bible in a year. Um, we, we, we have a, a quiet time devotionals that we're pushing really hard right now to get you in the Bible. The new version of that started today. We began in the book of Colossians. Uh, I read through the Bible chronologically myself. Every year we've done a chronological reading through the Bible as a church. We're always trying to get you to read the Bible is my point. And the reason for that is we know how important it is for you not to get lost. There's three reasons why we need to read the Bible, in my opinion. The first one can be summed up in the word discernment. 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 Discernment at its simplest is this. It's the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. We could say more about it, but that's really all we need to know about it. Discernment is the ability to look at a situation, a scenario, a circumstance, and know what the right way to go is and the wrong way to go is. That's discernment. What's righteous and what's unrighteous? What's holy and what's unholy? What is truth and what is error? And discernment is something that every single believer should have. Because the reality is, church, to live godly lives in an ungodly world, we have to have discernment. You are never going to live a godly life in an ungodly culture without great discernment. And yet, this is the one thing that is lacking in so many who claim to be Christians, who claim to be disciples, who claim to be children of the light. You look at them, or I look at them, or whatever, and I go, do you have no discernment? Can you not see the difference between right and wrong? You know, I, I get on social media from time to time. I told my wife the other day, I said, well, it's kind of funny, you know, like, you know you shouldn't be on there, but you like to be on there. It's kind of like driving through a bad neighborhood, you know, like, you roll the windows up, you lock the doors. And you know you shouldn't be there, but there's kind of something exciting about being there. It's kind of how I feel like when I'm, when I'm on social media. Like I'm in a bad neighborhood I shouldn't be in. And um, I'm, I'll scroll through social media, and I, I see posts of people who claim to be believers. They'll have Bible verses and stuff. And then their next post, I'll go, what are you thinking? Do you have no discernment? And the reality is they don't. They don't have any discernment. And the reason they don't have any discernment is because I'll, I'll promise you they're not reading the Bible. Listen, the writer of Hebrews was disgusted at the lack of discernment of some in the early church. I want you to hear what he had to say. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. He says, we have a great deal to say about this. And it is difficult to explain since you've become too lazy to understand. Well, he's not holding any punches there, is he? You're too lazy to even try to understand it. But we're going to try anyway. Verse 12, although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. In other words, you've already been taught it, but you need to be taught it again because you were too lazy to even pay attention the first time. And look at verse 13. Now everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness. Because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. In other words, when you're eating the real food, you develop discernment. And these people had none because they weren't eating the real food. They were just craving the milk, the stuff that was sweet and tasted good and was easy to get into their bellies. In short, the writer's saying, get off the bottle and come to the table and get some real food. To the Romans, the Apostle Paul wrote, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
And we all know that to be true, and we can preach on that all day long in the culture in which we live. But why did he want them to do that? Look at this next part, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. We need discernment. Philippians 1, 9 through 11. And I pray this, that your love, Paul says, will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of what? Discernment. So that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Right? The bottom line is that we all need a great deal of discernment. We need discernment to endure in this culture, in this world. We need discernment to engage the lost people who live and work around us. We need discernment to experience the full and abundant life that Jesus promised us. We need discernment to encourage one another as the word of God calls us to do. We need discernment to extinguish the fiery darts that the devil wants to throw at us. We need discernment, church, to expand God's kingdom. We need discernment to explain things to our children who are living in a much more crooked generation than we grew up in. Mom and dad, if you don't think you need to be in your Bible for you, get in it for your kids because they've got questions you will never be able to answer if you don't have a compass. And they're not old enough yet to have a compass. And so they're going to come to you with these questions and they're going to need answers. And if you don't have the discernment that's built up over time, this doesn't happen because you read the Bible 30 minutes today, But if you don't have the discernment that builds up over time from reading God's word, you're not going to have an answer for them. And I promise you, their teachers will give them an answer. I promise you, their friends will give them an answer. I promise you, the internet will give them an answer. You better have an answer. I love what the the, the psalmist said. Listen to Psalms 119, 9 through 16. How can a young man keep his way pure? It's a good question. The answer, by keeping your word. By knowing your word, believing your word, memorizing your word. And then he goes on, he says, I've sought you with my heart. Don't let me wander from your commands. I've treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Lord, may you be blessed. Teach me your statutes, your word. With my lips, I proclaim all the judgments from your mouth, his word. I rejoice in the way revealed by your decrees, his word, as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts, his word. And I will think about your ways, his word. He says, I will delight in your statutes, his word. And I will not forget your word. It takes a lot of spiritual discernment to remain pure, to know right from wrong. And we get that when we are in his word. To stay in God's will, to walk with the Lord, to reject this counterfeit culture and this wicked world that we live in, to know right from wrong and righteousness from unrighteousness and the difference between holiness and happiness and to choose rightly, we have to have discernment. It's not an easy task unless you have a compass. And when you have a compass, it's not all that hard at all. God's word in the matter is always God's will on the matter. And the better you know God's word, the easier it is to discern God's will. Here's the second thing that happens when we read God's word, when we study it, when we obey it, when we listen to it, when we ingest it into us in every possible way. We get clear direction. Not only do we develop over time this sense of discernment, but we also, when we dive into God's word, we get clear direction. Jerry, at one point in the journey, got into her tent, cleaned everything up, zipped herself up in her sleeping bag, and decided she was going to wait for a rescue and pray for a miracle. 
This is all according to her journal. She decided that since she had no direction, she didn't know which way to go, she was just going to stay put and stay there and hope someone would find her. She wrote in her journal she didn't want to get any further from the trail. She thought she was three or four miles from the trail. She was only two. But she had no idea which way to go. She had no direction at all. So she got into her tent. She zipped it up. She got into her sleeping bag. She zipped it up. She went through what food and water she had left. And then she died there waiting for a rescue. She had no clear direction. So she determined it was just better to sit and wait than to get up and do something. I wonder if she would have had a compass. And if she would have been able to get one of those text messages out, let's just say, theoretically. And someone was able to text her back and give her some direction. I wonder what she would have done. If they could have said something like, Jerry, walk east for one mile till you see the river. Follow the river upstream for 200 yards. There you're going to see a fallen tree. Cross over it. Continue east another 600 yards until you come to the big opening where the, mining, uh, the logging crew was last year. Cross through that opening, then walk another 500 yards east, and you will be on the trail. I wonder if she had some clear directions like that, how many of you think she would have died in her tent? I don't. I think she would have got up, packed up, got her compass, and headed east. Because it's different when you have clear direction, you're willing to try. Of course she wouldn't have sat there and waited to die. She would have rescued herself. See, I'm convinced that people do the exact same thing Jerry did. The reason most people get stuck in life is because they don't have any clear direction. They get stuck in debt because they don't have any clear financial direction. And so they, they zip themselves up in their tent. They zip themselves up in their zipping bag. Uh, the zipping bag, sleeping bag. My mind's getting ahead of me this morning. And they pray for a miracle. They go play the lottery, hoping that's going to fix it, <laughs> you know? They get stuck living in an apartment with somebody they're not married to, partly because they have no discernment, but also because they have no direction. They get stuck in a job or a career they hate, but hey, after all, it pays the bills. So they continue to do it because they have no purpose, they have no direction. They get stuck in some kind of an addiction because they don't have any direction. You see, we do the same thing that Jerry does all the time. Jerry did all the time. We crawl into our tent, we zip it up. We crawl into our sleeping bag because it feels a little better, we zip it up. And we just hope and pray somebody is going to come and rescue us. And what we don't realize is this. God has already sent Jesus to rescue us. He is the rescue plan. And he's already rescued us. And what we don't realize on top of that is God has already given us the directions. In his holy word. We literally, church, hold in our hands the very miracle we're hoping for. On our bookshelves and our coffee tables, on the dash of our vehicles, in the console of our vehicles, in the top drawer of our desk or the bottom drawer, whichever it might be, what you're looking for is already there. God's Word is a miracle. It's a miracle the way it came together. It's a miracle the way it's been sustained. It's a miracle the way it speaks to us all these thousands of years later that it's still living and active and true. It is the miracle you're hoping for. You've just got to pick it up and read it. It's the compass. I just love what the Lord said in Psalms 32, verse 8. He says, I will instruct you and I will show you the way to go. Isn't that good? He says, I will instruct you and I will show you the way to go. With my eye on you, I will give counsel. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding that must be controlled with a bit and a bridle or else it will not come near you. Many pains come to the wicked, but the one who trusts in the Lord will have faithful love surrounding him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. I'll show you the way to go. I'll give you direction. He's given us direction in his word. 
He's given us instruction in his word. It's divinely inspired instruction. It's the authority by which everything else is measured. It's the very word of God, and thus it is perfect direction that we all need. I love Paul's summary of it in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God, catch this, may be complete and equipped for every good work. You are not complete without the word of God. You will never be equipped for what God has created you for without the word of God. Without the word of God as your compass, what will happen is you will drift and eventually you'll get off the path to use the restroom or to take a break or to do something else and you'll get lost. The Bible is the instruction manual for life. It should never, ever be far from us. Romans 15, Paul said this, verses 4 through 6, he said, For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction. So that we may have hope through the endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another. According to Christ Jesus. So that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. Church, we know that God's word in the matter is always God's will on the matter. So if we know that to be true, and if we believe that, we should want to receive God's word. We should want to hear God's word. There's really only three things you can do with God's word. Three things every single person who can hear my voice. These are the three things you can do with God's word very quickly. First thing you can do with it is you can ignore it. It's a popular thing to do. A lot of people just ignore God's word. You say, well, I'm not ignoring it. I have it. Yeah, but you're not reading it. If you're not reading it, you're ignoring it. If you have it, if you know it's there, and if it's available, and you're not spending time in it, then you're ignoring it. You know God wrote it for you. You know it's got the direction you need. You know it will develop discernment in your life, but you still don't do anything with it. That's ignoring it. That's the first thing you can do. Second thing you can do is reject it. That's different than ignoring it. Some people will read it, but they won't obey it. That's rejecting it. And most people don't outright just reject the whole thing. There are people who will reject the whole thing. But I'll tell you what's most popular right now in our culture is this. We read God's word and we say this is the full counsel of God, but then we get to something that rubs up against us. We get to something that just doesn't make us feel real comfortable. We get to something that conflicts with our own lifestyle or the lifestyle of somebody we love, maybe a child, maybe an aunt, maybe an uncle. We get to something that that we go, you know what, Mm, I I can't accept that. It's a very popular thing to do today to say, I'm going to accept everything I want to accept about God's word, and I'm just going to reject the stuff and ignore the stuff that, that doesn't meet my culture, my lifestyle, my thoughts. And then we start to say things like, well, that was written for people a long time ago. You know, that was a different scenario. That was a different situation. That was that was for that church. It's not for us as a church. We start to make excuses for it. And really the truth is, what's happening when we do that is, um, well, I'll just be honest with you. The, The truth is, what we're doing right there is we're changing the Word of God. Because we don't want to be changed by the Word of God. So instead of being changed by the Word of God, instead of coming and saying, this is your perfect authority, this is your perfect direction... This is the compass by which I'm supposed to live my life. We say, hey, God, I'm going to change your word to match my lifestyle. I'm going to change your word to match what makes me comfortable. And God says, you can do whatever you want, but that ain't going to (laughs) work. See, what should happen is this third one, we should receive God's word. That's the third thing you can do with it. You can receive it. That's what we should do with it. It's what we should all do with it. We should receive it. We should allow it to change us. We should allow it to shape us and form us and mold us. And when we bump into something, and I'm telling you, you go to study in the Bible, you go to doing those daily devos, you go to reading chronologically, you go to doing anything you want inside God's Word, it won't be long before you bump up against something. You go, ah, oh, that don't make me feel real comfortable. 
And you know what? When you bump up against that, the worst thing you can do is start making excuses about it or excuses for yourself or excuses for the word, the word of God. The best thing you can do is say, Lord, this is the compass, this is the direction, so I must be wrong. What if I told y'all right now, and y'all, y'all are from here, so you probably already know, but what if I told you right now that was north? Yes or no? I could tell you all day that's north, and you would say, no. What, is that north? Right? You, you know which way is north because you've lived here. But this is what we do with God's word. We look at it, and we go, oh, that way's north? Yeah, I don't think so. I think that way's north. I'm going to do my own thing on this one. This compass will never be wrong on which way's north. Ever. And neither will this one you hold in your hands. It'll never be wrong. You're wrong, not this. If I say that way's north, I'm wrong, not this compass. Only three things you can do with the Word of God. And my challenge for you is to read it and receive it and be blessed by it, be encouraged by it, be equipped by it, and be changed by it. Receive direction from it. And you won't end up held up in your spiritual tent, all zipped up in your comfy sleeping bag because you've piled everything around you that makes you feel good, longing for direction as you wait to die. Instead, you'll cross the finish line on target and on time and on the path God created for you to run because you followed his compass and his direction. God's word in the matter is always God's word on the matter. Let me quickly share our third point today. It can be summed up with the word durable. I don't know about you, but I need something in my life that's durable. I need something in my life that I know I can trust. I need something in my life that I know I can count on no matter what. I need something in my life that when everything starts to shake and crumble and tremble, I can go and I can stand on it and I can say this is a solid foundation. I need something that's never going to let me down because y'all have let me down before. I need something that's never going to stab me in the back. I need something that's never going to give me a question that questions its validity or my calling. I need something so true and so firm and so straight and so solid that it will stand the test of time and still be true when I'm dead and gone. I need something like that in my life, and so do you. And I want to stand on solid ground, and I want to walk through this life on the word of God and the path that God has for me. And I'm telling you, this is the only thing I have ever found that can do it. Isaiah said this in Isaiah 40, verse 8. He says, the grass withers. Say amen if you believe that. The flowers fade. But the word of our God remains forever. Doesn't change. Jesus himself said, Matthew 24, 32, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know that the summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but catch this, my words will never pass away. Church, no matter what happens with my finances, no matter what happens with my family, no matter what happens in the next election, no matter what happens to my health, no matter what happens to my job or my career, no matter what happens in my life, the Word of God stays the same. You can turn this compass upside down. You can hold it sideways. You can, you can shake it and jiggle it and wiggle it and do everything you want to it, and it's going to still point north. It's the same way with God's word. It's a light unto my path. It's a solid rock for my feet to stand on. It is a happy and holy place for my heart to dwell. 
anytime I need it. It is durable and will never fail. You know, I bet if she could do it all over again, I bet Jerry would have bought a compass and learned how to use it. In the same way, when it's all said and done, I think most of us, as our lives are drawing to a close, most people would wish they had spent more time in the Bible. I was with a family and with someone who was on her deathbed this week. I do it often. It's part of my job. I told the first service, I've probably been at more deathbeds than all of you guys combined over the years. I've had a lot of final conversations with people. You know what I've never heard anybody say in those moments, ever? I've never heard one person say, you know what, Pastor, I think I read the Bible too much in my life. I never heard one person say, you know what, if I could do it all over again, I wouldn't have spent so much time in God's Word. I've heard a lot of people say, I wouldn't, wish I wouldn't have spent so much time making money. I wish I wouldn't have spent so much time chasing recreational things. I wish I wouldn't have done this with my family or to my family. I wish I wouldn't have worked so much. I wish I would have gone to church more. I hear that a lot. But almost always, almost always, without a question, you know what, if people, if they're able to communicate, they'll say, they'll say, would you read some scripture to me? Because in that moment, they know that is the only durable thing they can still hold on to. You know, there are a lot of people who feel like God's against them or God wants them to be miserable. God just wants them to struggle through life, and that's why they don't have it as easy as everybody else. No, the reason they don't have it as easy as everybody else is because they got off the path to go to the restroom, and they never came back because they got lost without their compass. The Bible says that God wants all people to believe, to repent, to know him as Lord and Savior. The Bible says God loves you. The Bible says God cares for you. The Bible says God's so concerned for you that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross so you could live. The Bible says God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And he has a path that he has marked for you to walk on. The Bible says God will never leave you or forsake you no matter what you do to him. I want to read this to you. It comes from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. Listen to this. Paul says, This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all and a testimony at the proper time. That's what God wants. He wants everyone to be saved. So I want to close with this question. Are you in everyone? Because if you're in everyone, God wants you to be saved. If you're in everyone, God wants you in heaven. If you're in everyone, God wants you to have eternal life. If you're in everyone, he wants your name in the Lamb's book of life. God loves you and he wants you to be saved. That's a reality you need to understand. But the second reality also in this verse is this. There's only one way for that to happen, and that is for you to accept the love of the mediator, Jesus Christ. To accept what he did for you on the cross, to be washed in his blood, to be saved by his grace. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't pray for it. You can't read enough Bible to get it. It only comes through faith in Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. There's one path to heaven, and it's Jesus. The Bible, our compass, points us to Jesus from beginning to end because he is the only path to eternity in heaven. So if you haven't said yes to Jesus, I pray you would today. I pray this hour you would repent of your sins and give your life to him. God loves you. You're in everyone, and he wants you to be saved. Let's pray. If that's you and you're here this morning or can hear my voice, we invite you to pray with us. Just say this, say, Lord, it's me. 
I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me, that you would make me new. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love and for your mercy. Lord, as we come before you today, I, Lord, I just want to pray for these who have gathered here to worship you. Their hearts are true and sincere. And Father, there's other places they could have gone, other things they could have done this morning, but they're here to worship you. They love you. I pray that they sense and feel your love in this place and will when they leave too. And Lord, I especially pray for those who, as we've talked about this, have realized that they're off the path. Maybe they've even realized they're in a desperate situation like Jerry was, held up in their spiritual tents looking for direction, zipped up in a comfy sleeping bag, but knowing without a miracle, without some great rescue, this isn't going to end well. Lord, I pray that they would seek your word. Pray that they would read your word. Pray that they would listen and heed your word. And listen to your voice, for your voice, as you speak to them through it. Lord, help us not to look at your word as some magic wand that we can just flip open to any page and find some great eternal answer. Father, help us instead to look at it as the treasure and the miracle it is that we get to hold in our hands every day. Full of divine inspiration and divine instruction and divine direction. Father, help it to develop the discernment we need to live in this world and the direction we need to get back on your path. We thank you for it. I pray that everyone who reads it this week would be blessed by it. In Jesus' name, amen.